Uh, it is actually my really, really great pleasure to introduce Professor Nick Saunders, who is the Chief Commissioner of TEXA and has been for three years and in a former life was a VC. Um, he's going to give us the keynote this morning. Please welcome him, because he can hear you. Well, thanks very much, um, Deb, and, and Bill also for your welcome. And may I extend uh, Texas' welcome to you all as well. It's great to see so many people here this morning and, uh, and to participate in this uh, conference. To kick the conference off, I thought it might be of interest to you if I presented a brief overview of the outcomes of Texas' first six years of operation. And I've chosen to look outwards to look at outcomes of relevance to providers and particularly to students, rather than look inwards at Texas processes and resources, important though those uh, matters are. So here's what I'm going to cover. I'm going to start by briefly describing changes in the profile of the sector over the last six years. I'm then going to briefly describe and share with you some patterns of uh, risk in the sector with a focus on risk to students and also a focus on differences in risk profile among various provider groupings. I'm then going to talk about the relationship between adverse decisions and the higher education standards framework, the old standards, with a focus on re-registration decisions. And then I'm going to look at the relationship between those decisions and providers' risk ratings. I'm going to finish with a few words about uh, what you said about us in the July survey. And my final slide is going to conclude with just a brief mention of some challenges and future directions that we're contemplating at the moment. So let's get the gallop through the last six years underway and we'll start with a brief description of the sector profile. This slide is a snapshot of when TEXA began in 2012 and at the 30th of uh, uh, September this year. Here, for the sake of simplicity, I've simply divided the sector up into four groups. Universities, uh, uh, higher education providers that are not universities, enough of profit, and these include the for-profit pathway colleges, a similar grouping for not-for-profit providers and TAFEs. And you'll see that in the terms of numbers of providers, the sector has in fact shrunk a little uh, in, over the last six years, from 172 providers when we started to 165 today. And that shrinkage is completely explained by a reduction in the number of not-for-profit providers. Now, a slide like this which captures snapshots in points of time really masks the dynamics of the sector and in fact there has been significant turnover in the sector during this period of time. You'll see that we've actually lost 31 providers uh, that started uh, with us in 2012. We've lost them mainly from the not-for-profit and the for-profit sector but about 18% of providers that were with us in 2012 are no longer part of the sector and they've left because of voluntary withdrawals, mergers and in a very small number of cases to Texas rejection of their renewal of registration. And these 31 providers have been replaced by 24 new providers which have been registered by Texa over the last six years. One thing to note is there's been absolutely no change whatsoever in the university category since Texas' inceptions, not even in the university college category. And indeed, over the last six years, we've only had one application for change of category to a university of specialisation and one for university college category. And I think this is almost certainly due to the very strict and complex provider category standards that are in place. They're now called uh, category criteria. And as you know, these categories uh, criteria are soon to be 
uh, reviewed as part of the reform agenda that the Minister spoke about in his video. So whilst the sector itself has got smaller in terms of numbers of providers, of course student enrolments have grown. 2015 figures are shown here because uh, we haven't yet received final figures for the 30 or so providers that don't actually uh, participate in the fee help scheme. So I can't give you a complete picture for 2016. You can see here that there's been about a 12% growth in the sector between 2012 and 2015. And understandably, given the size of the university sector compared uh, with the size of uh, the uh, higher education provider non-university sector, uh, most of that growth has occurred within universities. But it is important to note two things. First of all, the rate of growth amongst non-university higher education providers has been rapid, 40% over that period of time. And when you look at the 36,000 or so student enrolment growth that has occurred in that sector, and of the total of about 155,000, you'll see that non-university providers have in fact contributed 25% of the growth uh, of university enrolments, whereas in actual fact they enrol less than 10% of the students overall. Now, as the, uh, that growth has occurred, it's occurred in the higher education providers um, in both domestic and overseas uh, or international students. So the majority of, um, of non-university higher education students remain the domestic cohort, but note the gro rapid growth in international student numbers in these providers from around 28,000 in 2012 to around 51,000 in 2015. That's a growth of nearly 80%, such that international students now make up over 40% of the enrolments at higher education providers who are not universities. And as student uh, numbers have grown in the sector, so too has total sector revenue grown. It's grown by almost, uh, well, by $5 billion uh, uh, during this period, 2012 to 2016, and almost entirely due to growth in revenue amongst the providers who we inherited when we started in 2012 and have remained in the sector since. The revenue loss from providers leaving the sector has really been balanced by revenue being generated by the newly registered providers. So in summary, the last six years has seen about a 20% turnover of providers, relative stability in the size of the provider groups with a small 15% or so shrinkage of the non-university not-for-profit sector and growth in student enrolments and revenue um, uh, along the way. I now want to turn to patterns of uh, risk in the sector and first of all, I want to uh, take you through this schematic as a reminder of our uh, risk assessment process. So we'll start with the four blue boxes across the middle of the slide. The first three of these boxes are based on indicators measured uh, within the framework. They relate to uh, students, to academic staff, and to finances, both short-term viability and longer terms to sustainability. And to those measured indicators, which form up part of the risk assessment framework, we add a consideration of a provider's regulatory history and standing. This serves as an indicator, if you like, of the confidence that TEXA might have in a provider. We consider these dimensions in the context of the provider, shown here, across the top of the slide, for example, the maturity of the provider, the breadth of its offerings, or a major component being perhaps online or offshore delivery. Now, if you're a provider that have splashes of moderate and high risks, orange and yellow, in your risk ratings, we'll have a conversation with you about those risks and the mitigating strategies that you're, you're taking 
and after that we will form a view and distill all that information into two risks, overall risk to students and overall risk to financial position. Now I want to focus now on, fo uh, on risk to students and show you what's been happening in terms of trend over the last few years. So here's a plot of overall risk to students for 2014, 15 and 16, showing the number of providers in each rating category, low risk, moderate risk and high risk. And clearly the number of low risk providers is falling and the number of moderate and high risk providers, uh, providers is rising. That is, in the case of overall risk to students, uh, there's an apparent steady redistribution of risk in the sector to higher categories. And if we review the individual student and staff risk indicators that I mentioned a moment ago, it gives us some insight into the background, what sits behind uh, this trend. So first of all, the student performance indicators. Here's the distribution of risk ratings for two student performance indicators, first year student attrition and student progress across the three years 2014 to 2016. And here it's expressed as a percentage of providers in each of the risk categories for those uh, indicators. So firstly note that attrition risk is high in the sector. Less than 50% of providers are rated by TEXA to be low risk for student attrition. And if anything, this high risk is in trending higher. We've reported an analysis of uh, institutional factors that might be associated with uh, first year attrition recently in a publication that's available uh, on our website. Student progress outcomes are, have better risk ratings uh, than attrition, but again, the trend is towards higher risk. And then when we, when we look at the provider staffing indicators, uh, first of all, uh, it's pleasing to see that there's an improving trend in provider risk ratings in relation to senior academic leadership. Things on the, there seem to be on the improve. However, the trends in risk ratings for casualisation of academic staff and student staff ratios are towards higher risk, not lower risk. So while the trend in these indicators help explain the trend in higher overall risk levels in the rating of overall risk to students, questions may well be asked about the appropriateness of the indicators that we're using and the appropriateness of the rating thresholds that we set to define low, medium, moderate and, and high risk when we're making an overall judgement about risk in Australia's higher education sector. Uh, for example, are the, um, the indicators that we are using appropriate? Should we be using additional indicators or indeed alternative indicators? I'm now going to present to you uh, a risk matrix that's based on the data for 2016 for the sector as a whole, and I'm going to use both overall risk ratings in doing, uh, presenting this information. So let me uh, orient you. Across the top, we have provider risk to financial position going from low to high uh, from um, your left to right. This matrix defines the position of each of the 139 providers when we consider this in relationship also to risk to students down the left-hand side of the slide, uh, going from low at the bottom row up to high at the top. This analysis only relates to 139 of the providers in 2016 for which we had risk ratings, overall risk ratings for both finance and students. So I want to make a number of points from this slide. First of all, across the top row, we have 22 pr providers identified as high risk to students. That's 16% of the sector. 
By contrast, only two providers shown in the right-hand column of that slide are rated as high risk to financial position. So you'll see in each of the categories that uh, high risk and moderate risk uh, is much higher in the um, uh, risk to students than it is to risk to financial position. Now, those with a low risk appetite would like to see everybody clustered in the bottom left-hand corner of this matrix. Here we've got 64 providers that are rated low risk for both students as well as for financial position. Thankfully, there's no provider sitting in the top right-hand corner identified as high risk for both students and finances. Now, the interpretation of this slide really depends upon your appetite for risk. Our view is that providers with a high risk rating or a rating that has moderates for both uh, finance as well as students require closer scrutiny. That's 41 out of 139 providers shown on this slide or about 30% of the sector. So I'm now going to take universities out of this analysis. Universities, almost without exception, are rated in that bottom right-hand corner, low risk to students, low risk to finances, and look at what the risk profile is of the remainder of the sector. So first of all, in 2006, this is the risk profile for not-for-profit providers. There are a small number of providers, not-for-profits, who are rated as high risk. That's 6% of this particular group in the sector. And only one is, related, uh, is rated um, high risk to financial position. 22 providers, that's 44% of this population, are rated low risk to both um, students and finances. And about 50% of the not-for-profit sector has at least one of those uh, ratings in the moderate range. So overall, one could say that the risk profile of the not-for-profit sector in Australia is towards the lower end, the lower risk end of, of the spectrum. By contrast, here's the risk profile of the for-profit sector. 19 of 48 providers, 40%, are rated by TEXA as high risk to students. And there's an additional provider identified as high risk in terms of their financial position. So these 20 providers, 19 high risk for students and one high risk for finances, uh, make up, uh, they're 20 of 24 that uh, were identified in that slide I showed at the sector of the whole. So in other words, 83% of our high risk providers <coughs> sit in the for-profit uh, sector. And note also that there are only six providers, 13% of the for-profits, who sit in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide, being rated low risk in both dimensions. Now, there's not time today for me to discuss with you the possible reasons that sit behind these findings. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance to talk about this during the conference, over coffee, or perhaps even during some of the sessions. But there are a number of possibilities that do need to be considered. First of all is that Texas risk assessment framework is not fit for purpose for for-profit providers because of there are technical issues, for example, the calculation of attrition in uh, providers that have a trimester model of delivery or because of the for-profit's um, business model. A second possibility is that the student outcome data doesn't really reflect the quality of the education that's being provided in the for-profit sector. And there's some evidence to support that um, proposition in that those pro for-profit providers who actually participate in the quilt surveys often are shown to have very high levels of student satisfaction in terms of the student's own experience. So perhaps for in the for-profit sector, the proxies that we're using for quality in terms of student outcomes aren't quite uh, right. The third possibility is that Texas is biased, either consciously or unconsciously, against for-profit higher education provision. 
That's not my experience, but it's worthwhile uh, exploring. And lastly, a fourth possibility is that the matrix is actually a true reflection of the state of play with regards to risk in the sector. We want to have a further conversation with for-profit providers over the next uh, 12 months and their peak bodies to better understand the issues that you're facing and to get a better understanding of what sits behind um, these, these ratings. So I now want to move away from talking about uh, risk and talk about uh, um, decision making at, at TEXA. And I'm going to present just briefly some data relating to adverse decisions with regards to applications for renewal of registration covering the period 2013 and 2016. During that time, we made 108 re-registration decisions, 30% or so of which were adverse. And by adverse, I mean that a condition or conditions were applied on the registration or the registration period was uh, shorter than the usual seven years <coughs> or it, indeed that uh, the, the registration, re-registration application uh, was rejected. We've analysed what sits behind that in terms of which higher education standards related to these adverse decisions. And here on this slide, what I've shown are the seven sections of the uh, 2011 higher education framework uh, provider registration standards from one being provider standing through finance, governance, across to uh, the, uh, the seventh section of the, of the 2011 standards which relate to uh, resources, particularly um, the facilities and infrastructure. And the height of the columns for each of those sections uh, expresses whether that st what percentage of time that standard was included in uh, those um, adverse decisions. And you can see, first of all, that uh, e each section of the standard contributed in some way um, in at least uh, some of those uh, decisions, adverse decisions, but the two standout um, um, areas in the standards relate to governance, corporate and academic governance, and what's labelled here as staffing, but in the standards is called management and, and human resources. So the common issues that we c confronted when making decisions about re-registration, first of all related to the, the corporate structure of the organisation, the structure of the corporate uh, governing body, the poor separation of corporate and academic governance, and the poor separation of governance and management within the institution, uh, lack of evidence of monitoring and management of risk, insufficient evidence of robust planning and ineffective quality assurance. For the provider registration section five to do with management and human resources, the common issues uh, related to the number and qualifications of staff, the lack of comparison of performance with other providers and the lack of evidence of internal and external feedback uh, to uh, improve uh, quality. So now we've now got a new set of standards, the 2015 Higher Education Standards Framework, uh, but the issues embedded in the 2011 um, uh, framework uh, are still there in the new standards and the, uh, our experience to date in making decisions around the new standards are that some of these issues uh, remain prevalent uh, in making assessments uh, based on the new standards. So we've talked about risk, and we've talked about adverse decisions. Let me show you now the relationship between risk ratings and outcomes for renewal of registration. So here two years are shown, the years 2014 and 15 and then 2015 and 16 above. For simplicity, I've divided the groupings of providers into two groups, those with a low risk rating uh, and those with a moderate to high risk rating. And I've really classified the outcomes as either being adverse or positive. 
And the message here is very clear, that if you're a low-risk provider seeking re-registration, there's less than a 10% chance um, that an adverse uh, decision will be taken about your re-registration. On the other hand, if you're categorised as a moderate to high-risk provider, then the chances are between 70 and 80% based on this data uh, that uh, an adverse decision will be taken. Now it's wrong to consider that the risk ratings are somehow predictive of the outcomes because they're not independent, of these, these two dimensions are not independent of each other. I've already pointed out that we actually use regulatory history, uh, if, for example, when making the, the decisions about the overall risk ratings at the beginning, and we also obviously have a consideration of risk uh, when we're considering well, what actions to take on the basis of the assessment of the applications. But there is a clear message here, and that is that it is in providers' interests to pay attention to their risk ratings and to drive their risk ratings to lower levels of risk. That will increase the chances very significantly of registration and the, indeed accreditation decisions about courses uh, being uh, positive for you. Well, enough about providers and risk and outcomes. Let me talk now a little bit about the TEXA stakeholder survey that you kindly filled in for us um, in the middle of uh, this year. So what did you, first of all, here's a, a, a slide showing the basic uh, information about the survey. It was independently conducted. It had a moderately high response rate of 74% so that we can have confidence uh, in the findings, so I thank you for, for those people who took the time to fill in the survey. And the survey was designed around, first of all, the government mandated uh, performance areas that are in the regulator performance framework. Uh, we also asked questions about a provider's recent uh, interaction with TEXA. And we were also asked uh, providers to rate TEXA's overall performance uh, as, a, as a regulator. So overall performance of TEXA was rated to be good or excellent by 80% of providers. You know, it was 82% in 2016, the first year of the survey. So we took heart from that. The providers, by and large, were very positive about the guidance material that we produce, the fact that we have a case management approach, and they also were very complimentary of last year's conference. So we thank you for those uh, positive comments. However, major concerns were expressed about the turnover of case managers and the consequent loss of continuity um, of case management and knowledge of the provider, and the deterioration in our performance in relationship to the timeliness of our decision making. Now these are important matters, uh, which we've detailed some more background about that in our 2016 annual report, which was tabled in Parliament recently and was on a, is on our website. And you won't be surprised to know that resource issues sit at the heart of the problem. It's also important to, uh, to note that there are quite stark differences of view about Texas performance among different groups of providers. So if you're a large provider, low risk, self-accrediting, and remember we have not just universities self-accrediting at the moment, we have 11 non-university providers that are self-accrediting. Self so if you're large, low risk, self-accrediting, you're very satisfied with our performance. But if you're small, if you're for profit, then you are much less positive about Texas performance. And this is shown on the next slide, which is a busy slide, but let me briefly describe it to you. Down the left-hand side, there are a variety of performance indicators to do with matters such as timeliness, clarity, proportionate action, consistency, and case management. Across the top of the slide are various provider groupings, universities, for-profit providers, and the not-for-profit group that are divided into faith-based and other providers. And the numbers in the columns, if you can read them, refer to the percentage of the group 
uh, that rated texts are either excellent or good for that particular KPI or dimension. And I put a circle around the four profit numbers, which I think you'll clearly see uh, have a much more, for profit providers have a much more negative view about TEXA than other provider groups. Now, again, we hear the message and we're keen to, keen to explore this further uh, with providers, not just the for profits, but with providers generally and particularly with for profit providers uh, and their peak. Uh, bodies, and I'm looking forward to participating in those discussions over the next uh, 12 months. Well, enough of looking back over the last six years. Now have a, let's have a quick glimpse at the future. And I've just listed here a few of the ideas that are about challenges facing the sexa, sector and indeed TEXA and some possible future directions for TEXA um, that, that, is exercising our, that are exercising our minds at the moment. So what do I mean by conception and delivery of higher education? Well, even today we've had media commentary on matters such as return on investment, work-based learning, job readiness, vocational outcomes for higher education graduates, and as well as that there are significant moves towards developing just-in-time learning, micro-credentialing, and advances in technology uh, including the use of artificial intelligence machines to help in the delivery of higher education. And I guess for me this raises a question about what will be higher in tomorrow's um, higher education. And as higher education changes, what's the relevance of the current standards framework? What's the relevance of the Australian qualifications framework? What's the relevance of our own approach to regulation in this new environment? In terms of categories of higher education institutions, again, there's a lot of commentary at the moment about just how necessary research is, how central research is to the, uh, to the definition of a university. And are teaching only or teaching intensive universities appropriate? And if so, should there be particular essential characteristics to define a university, or can all higher education providers uh, that are registered with TEXA claim the title of university? As you know, there's a review that's going to ha be, uh, happen in uh, next year about the uh, university, uh, uh, sorry, the provider uh, categories, and uh, you'll get your chance, I think, to contribute to that discussion during that review that will be undertaken by the higher education standards panel. Provider partnerships becoming much more um, complex and many are international and a key issue for us at TEXA is how do we leverage um, our own national and international part partnerships to uh, minimise regulatory burden while assuring uh, quality. I don't uh, know yet what the future risk appetite of various players in the sector will be, the government's risk appetite, what will providers and their peak bodies uh, have to say about risk in the sector, how, how much can be tolerated, what's our own view, what's the community's view. And it's, uh, it's also, I think, important to ask questions around systemic risk in the sector, such as the recent examples to do with academic integrity, student attrition, and uh, sexual harassment uh, and assault at high um, uh, education providers. Who should be responsible for it, identifying the sector-wide risks? Who should be account held accountable for managing them and by whom? If risk appetite increases, I guess the sector will become more comfortable for TEXA to move to a monitoring approach rather than the repeated cyclical assessment uh, uh, site, uh, uh, process that we have at the moment, particularly for low-risk providers. Do, how do people feel about this now? Is it time for us to move for low-risk providers to a simple monitoring and certification process? Or is that too much, too big a step to take? And finally, how can TEXA and the professional accreditation bodies work more closely together 
again to minimise regulatory burden on the sector and to ma maximally assure uh, quality. This list is uh, not exhaustive and there are plenty of food for thought. So with that I'll conclude by saying that um, uh, the last six years of, uh, the first six years of Texas life has been interesting, it's been a learning experience I think for everybody. I think we have a good understanding of the state of the sector at the moment, the entire sector, not just the university sector, um, and that we recognise that as higher education changes, and uh, so too our approach will need to change as well. Thanks very much. Unbelievable. My running sheet says he should finish at 10.49. Unbelievable. You can self-regulate any time you like, Nick. <laughs> All right, uh, we now have time for questions and we're going to experiment with the conference app. I have some questions in front of me. I'm gonna read them out and Nick, you're gonna answer them, I hope. <laughs> All right, the first question is, I was surprised to see 8% of low-risk providers still receiving an adverse registration outcome in 2015 to 16. What are some of the other factors that Texa takes into account that could result in an adverse outcome of this kind? Okay, so I think it's important to note the difference between um, uh, risk assessment and quality. I mean, we use the risk assessment as a flag, as a lead to, uh, as to whether we should be looking more or less closely at, at matters. So being high risk does not mean being low quality. Given the indicators that we used, it would be fair to say that in our measures, uh, high risk does mean lower quality, but it does not mean that the quality is not um, satisfactory. Conversely, being low quality on the measures that we use does not mean that when we actually look at a re-registration application, we find uh, faults that weren't clearly de defined by the risk assessment, and so we take action in that regard. All right, next question is, do you see growth in for-profit providers and given their higher risk, an overall increase in risk in higher ed? Uh, yes, I see growth in the for-profit sector. I think the, the, experience, the data I showed you about growth in student enrolments, 40% growth between 2012 and 2015, uh, means that there is a demand out there and for-profit providers uh, are clearly um, meeting that demand. Um, does it mean necessarily that there will be uh, always higher risk in the sector with for-profits? I think, again, the way we're defining it, it's highly likely. If you look at um, surplus margins, if you look at investment in terms of empl employee benefits, in other words, staff salaries and those sorts of things, you'll find that the for-profits ha have a different profile uh, in terms of their financial outcomes and investments than do the not-for-profits and the universities. So yes, I think there will be higher risk, but again, I don't think that necessarily means that it's a bad thing overall for the sector. This is an interesting one. As more courses move to fully online provision, does that also indicate a move to higher risk in the sector? Um, we're still finding our, our way with this. I mean, um, online provision um, is, is uh, the matters to do with quality assurance of online provision. I think we're still finding our way and it's a difficult territory because just as we think we're getting a handle on it, the way in which technology is developing online delivery then moves in, into another sort of space. For example, um, we've been criticised in terms of the standards because the standards were talking about facilities and IT infrastructure being held in the provider, whereas the IT systems are now moving into the cloud. So um, we're feeling our way here, but at the moment I think we would have to say that if you're a 100% online provider and you don't have good student outcomes, we, we are nervous about you. That doesn't mean that we you know, are, are out to take uh, sort of regulatory action against you but it does mean that I think we would need to be assured that you have very strong quality assurance um, uh, processes, you have very strong assurance processes in terms of academic integrity to, to, uh, uh, to be able to support that, that, that delivery mode. We only have time for those three questions. We are keeping a record of all the questions and I would encourage you to approach speakers during the breaks if your question wasn't asked at the end of each session. Nick, thank you so much. Thank you. Big round of applause.